Okay, let's get cranked up here. I'm going to take a break for uh, this time slot and give up uh, some time to my cousin Shannon Kelly. Uh, his dad, my mom, not that you care, but his dad, my mom, brother and sister, uh, very close in age, a year, less than a year apart. They're both gone now. Uh, we have, they were uh, two of six siblings. There's one, one sibling left, Florence. Uh, you're going to tell about Florence in the middle here later, I hope. If you don't, I'll build. So, one way or the other. Uh, he works for Tamco, uh, in case you're curious. He lives down in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, he grew up in Springfield, close to where I grew up. We knew each other Christmas and Thanksgiving, pretty much. Uh, we, we crossed paths. I think last time I saw him was maybe four or five years ago. He came up. I hadn't seen him a long time before that. I actually was his high school English teacher. <laughs> So if he gets something wrong, gram grammatically, well, he had other English teachers too, so they assumed that's their, their problem. Anyway. Now he was, uh, I went to a new school in 85, uh, new to me, teach English and journalism, and he was a junior senior the first two years I was teaching there, so, yeah. so that was fun. That was in uh, Rogersville, Logan Rogersville, yeah. Uh, the Wildcats, I think it was Wildcats. Okay, that's good to know. Anyway. I don't have to know, but it's good to know. Uh, he has collected World War I uh, items since he was in high school. And he is a much older man now. So uh, he, he's uh, short of his 50th birthday, I think, or so. So anyway, he uh, loves all things military. Uh, he travels and visits all kinds of museums. I mean, he's just me if I had more money. Yeah. <laughs> and time. But anyway, uh, he does present, by the way, in high schools mostly. And uh, in uniform, he's going to kind of do that sort of thing for you this morning. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to ask all kinds of questions about Go Boys that I probably don't know the answer to. If I, I he'll he'll know. I just always guarantee you he'll know. So, uh, welcome Shannon. We'll give him this time slot. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, as he said, my name is Shannon Kelly. And I'm a student of the, uh, of the Great War, the World War, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. I've had a good two days. I slept well last night. Uh, I've enjoyed myself, and I'm tickled at such a large group. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, a lot of people have, have asked me, why, why the Great War? And as Tim pointed out, you know, because World War II and, and the Civil War, that's where all the movies are made and whatnot. But, the Great War, as he pointed out, our grandfather was in company of the 353rd Infantry, 89th Division, and served in France. And so everything that I've done, uh, all the research I've done, the travels, and the presentations I give are in his memory, and his honor. And so that's why, why I'm standing before you today. Uh, you know, I've given presentations for the last probably 15 years, uh, Rotary Clubs, uh, Adopts the American Revolution chapters, uh, genealogy societies, even members uh, of, of, of Congress. Uh, but probably the most rewarding and yet frustrating group that I speak to are high school students. Uh, as he mentioned, I live near Joplin, and in Joplin, uh, I, I usually ask the kids when I'm giving a presentation, have you ever seen a the circus or have you ever been to a concert and they all say oh yes 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 well, where was it and they say memorial hall and then i ask them i know i've got them on the hook here when was memorial hall built why was it built and that's where i get the blank stares and i explain to them that memorial hall like thousands of other memorial halls were built in the 1920s joplin's was 1925 and it was to, to remember the Great War, the World War. Now you notice I call it the Great War or the World War. Why, why am I not calling it World War I if I'm in the 20s? There is no two yet. They couldn't even imagine that there would be a second one of those things. So, so you'll hear me, I'll kind of bounce around with my nomenclature, but First World War, Great War. Uh, and so, so I explained to them that this is in remembrance of, of the First World War. And this morning I would like to share with you uh, uh, 
some of the presentation that I give these high school students. Uh, I think you've been studying about the, the causes of the war and the politics perhaps behind it. Today I'm going to tell you about the experience of the American soldier. What was it like on the Western Front in France during the First World War? I'll try to keep this in front of me. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So, uh, as you might notice, I'm not dressed as the normal civilian today. This is an original uniform. It's the model 1917, or the model 1918 overcoat, breeches, uh, putties, kept muck and rock and dirt from getting up your pant leg and into your boots. Uh, this is the, the, the combat helmet, the steel helmet, gas mask bag. So this is, this is the real deal, and I can tell you it is wool. It is real wool. And I will, I will be feeling this all the way back to Joplin this evening. And I always, I always say a little prayer before I start these. One, that I give a good presentation, and two, that there is air conditioning. <laughs> Out, outdoor events in August hurt. So, let's, let's just make sure you guys are on, on, on uh, a good foundation here. As you've been studying World War I, we're talking 1914 to 1918. Some might say 1919 because of when the actual treaty was signed. But for our purposes, we're going to say 1914 and 1918. On one side, you've got the British, the French, the Belgians, eventually the Italians, New Zealanders, Canadians, uh, Australians, Japanese, Chinese. And on the other side, and I'm, I didn't list them all, on the other side, we have the Empire of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Turks, Bulgaria. So it truly is a, a, uh, a global conflict. Now you notice I didn't mention the United States. The United States doesn't join the war, and they join the war obviously on the side of the French and the British, in 1917, April of 1917. And they are very ill prepared for war, very. There's a standing army of 125,000 men, and to put that in perspective, that's smaller than the army of Portugal at the time. So they've got to raise an army very, very quickly. Multi-million man army in a very short amount of time. And they were very successful at this. The way they did this was you had the regular army, the 125,000, as enlistees would come in, they would grow the, uh, the units of the regular army. Then they activated the National Guard, and that became what was known as the National Guard Army. And then the draftees went into what was called the National Army. So if you ever hear those terms, there were three components of the American Expeditionary Force. The term, the name that was given to the soldiers that were going overseas. Now it used to be that I would ask of these soldiers how many are left alive. And I think we all know that the last one passed away. The last American soldier passed away in 2011. Does anybody know his name. His name was Frank Woodruff Buckles. He was on the news. He was the last doughboy, and I'm going to come back to that term here in a minute. He, uh, he died at the age of 110. I met him when he was much younger. Uh, he was only 102. Uh, we became friends. We sent, I have Christmas cards from him. Uh, we, we sent uh, letters back and forth. I visited him on uh, several occasions, interviewed him. Uh, brilliant man and, and, and an amazing memory. Uh, I could sit here and tell you a, a, an afternoon's worth of stories that I, that I memorized from him. <laughs> but to give you an idea of, of the history of this man, he was born the same day as Clark Gable, February 1st, 1901. He went to France on the Carpathia, which, if you've been studying this, it was the ship that picked up the Titanic survivors. He told me stories from his, grand, his great grandfather, who remembered as a boy visiting with Revolutionary War veterans. 
And what was most exciting to me is that in, in I think it was 1921 at a speaking engagement in Oklahoma, he, he went to see a particular general and Mr. Buckles had been a driver during the First World War and so he, 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 he always had gloves and he was in uniform and he, he looked something like a cavalryman. Well, the general spotted him because of the way he stood and he had four overseas chevrons, which was meant that he had been over there for two years, which was unique. The general was Persian and he shook his hand. And so I was very careful to make sure of which hand had had been in the hand of the general and I shook that hand and that is my connection to Black Jack but I can't I can't sit here and talk about Mr. Buckles all day long and I and, but I could wonderful man so so they grow this 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 army into four million men they begin putting them in, in combat divisions and they would train for six months then it was reduced to four months and as i think you you watched the video on black jack how they were sending troops over that were that were hardly trained at all our grandfather went over within about four weeks uh, and finished some of his training in france but as things were progressing they were sending troops over earlier and earlier now they were, as I mentioned, they were dressed like this. Uh, they had their packs, about a 60 pound pack fully loaded. Now, now that remember this, we're, we as a society are growing. The average doughboy in the First World War was approximately 145 pounds, five foot seven. The average soldier today in the American Army is about 175 pounds, 5'10 to 5'11. I happen to be just about the right size of an average soldier. So for me to wear a uniform from the First World War, I was a big guy. I would have been a monster in the trench. I would have probably had one of those cool names for the big guy. But, but uh, for that reason, there's only a couple of the uniforms that I can even get in because of the size. But, now I mentioned the name Doughboy. I think you've all heard that. And the, and the Blackjack video mentions where the Doughboy name came from. Can anybody tell me the origin of the Doughboy name? The, the dust. Now the interesting thing is, it, when I was a kid they talked about, well it was because they ate so many baked goods at the British Red Cross units in England. <laughs> Crumpets and tea, they, they, were, they were doughy. Well, it actually dates back to 1846 is the first time that, that you hear the name Doughboy and it's in the American Southwest. The Blackjack video didn't touch on what, where the dust was. 1846, the Mexican War in the Southwest, they're covered in dust and the cavalry either made fun of them because they looked like they had been rolled in flour like dough, or it was a corruption of the word adobe because they looked like little adobe huts moving about. <laughs> Nobody's sure of the origin, but it, it dates back that far. But it really catches on in the First World War. Maybe that was the crumpets that, that drove it over the top. I don't know. But that's when you first hear it. Well, after the American soldiers, they board their ships, the troop ships, thousands of men going over to France, England, in convoys to, of course, avoid the U-boats. They arrive in France under the command of Blackjack. And when they get to France, what is it that they find? What is the unique feature of the battlefield that everybody acquaints with World War I? Trenches. The trenches. And that's really what I'm gonna, gonna talk about here is the trenches. The, uh, a lot of people, asked me, well, why, why, why were there trenches? What, how'd that get started? Well, you need to take a look at the weaponry and the tactics of the period. Because in a lot of ways, the tactics of World War I at the beginning hadn't changed that much from the Napoleonic Wars, the early 1800s. Let me give you an example here. 
the average rifleman, or the average, in the 1850, they didn't have rifles yet, it was muskets, in, at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, a soldier could fire one well-aimed shot with an effective range of about 100 yards. By the American Civil War, with the rifled musket, three well-aimed shots at an effective range of about 400 to 500 yards. By World War I, you've got the bolt-action rifle, and you're able to fire 10-plus rounds at maybe an effective range of 700 yards. But there's a new weapon on the battlefield that changes everything, and that's the machine gun. Now, one individual, maybe with somebody feeding, but one individual can pull the trigger of something that can fire 400 to 600 rounds with an effective range of 1,500 to 2,000 yards. And so the early, the early battles, the 18th and 19th century, where you would try to punch a hole in the line of your opponent, send your cavalry through, wrap up the flanks, those days were gone because it didn't take but, but a handful of men with some machine guns to hold off a very large number of infantry and cavalry approaching. And so what you get, as the Germans sweep in to, to Belgium and France, eventually they're stalemate. And they start trying to outflank one another, left and right, left and right, left and right. And nobody can get the advantage. Nobody wants to go back. Nobody can go forward. They've already tried left and right. Can't fly. So what do you do? Start digging in. And at first, it's sort of makeshift defensive positions, and, and before you know it, it becomes this, this system of trenches that we know today, that we, that we think of with the First World War. The, the trenches, eventually, they try to outflank one another for the, for the distance of about 450 miles, from Switzerland all the way to the North Sea. Think about that. Driving on an interstate, that would mean that I could drive for a roughly seven hours straight if I'm speeding a little too. And just barely cover the distance of the western front. And you got to think there's an eastern front too with the Russians. By the end of the war, they believed that with all the different types of trenches that were built and the movement of the trenches, the communication trenches, the reserve trenches, 25,000 miles of trenches were dug by hand on the Western Front while you're being shot at. To put that into perspective, 25,000 miles is almost exactly the distance around the Earth at the equator. By hand. So, let's talk a little bit about these trenches. A trench was about six to seven feet deep. It was about six feet wide. The front of the trench was called the parapet. The back of the trench was called the paradeau. And the bottom of the trench, because remember I said the average soldier was about five seven, for them to be able to, to fire over the trench, there was what was called a fire step which was a couple of feet high to where they could step out of the bottom and lean over and fire across when necessary. Now, for those of you that have never been to Belgium or France, I can tell you it is a pretty moist climate. It's near the North Sea, and the water table is fairly high there. So when you when you dig a seven foot hole in the ground and the water table is high, what do you create? Mud. 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 And I'm not talking about, oh, I've gotten my boots dirty mud. I'm talking about mud that would come up to their, to their thighs. Mud, and, and I've, 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 I've been to a reenactment trench that was rained on and put my hand down in the mud, and it's almost like a, it's almost like a pottery clay. It's, it's a mud that will suck you in. There were stories of horses that would slip off of 
off of wooden planks and just disappear within the shell holes. So it's it's a it's a terrible filthy mud. And that's that's really what these trenches were all about. These were, as the soldiers would say in their memoirs, these were hellish places. This wasn't, they didn't live in the trenches, they just sort of existed in them. So you're dealing with the mud. They would they had they had pump systems, they had uh, they had what they were called duck boards. These were wooden planks that were in the bottom of it to try to keep uh, you from, from sinking in the mud. But the mud was an ever constant problem. But there were also things such as general boredom. And a lot of people don't think about that, but you didn't stick your head out of these trenches. It was only when you were going on the attack or somebody was attacking you that you ever stuck your head out of these trenches because there were snipers on the other side. There were stories of young men that would show up in the trenches and within the first five minutes would want to itch a peak. And these do not stop bullets. So there were stories of young men that were there a few moments and they were gone. So you stayed down in the muck, in the nastiness. And so for long hours they would sit there and they would read the same letters over and over again. They would, they would look at the, the pictures of their loved ones back home, their sweethearts and wives. They would play cards incessantly. Roll their own cigarettes. This is one of the original Bull Durham cigarette rollers. It's got the rolling papers in the back. But there were other things in the trenches besides the boredom and the mud. <laughs> Bicks were not one of them. <laughs> so, if I'm in a trench in 1918 and I'm doing this, what do you suppose I'm doing? I heard it. The knits, lice knits that were laid in the seams of your trousers and your hat. They were covered in lice constantly. They could go to a delousing sta station, would be back in the trenches. Within moments, they were covered again. So they got very good at figuring out how to fry the knits, the lice eggs, out of their, their clothing without burning their clothing. You've heard the term knit picking, <laughs> picking of the knits, where it comes from, and chatting. They're called chats. So they would sit together, and the term chatting, some people say chatting came first, some say it was named after that. One way or another, they would sit around and they would chat, picking the lice out of their clothing. <laughs> And if the if the, the lice and the boredom, and you got to remember, if you're standing in mud all the time, you ever washed dishes too long or stayed in the bathtub too long, and how your fingers start to shrivel? Think about spending weeks standing in water. Your feet begin to shrivel. Infection begins. Gangrene and eventually amputation. But if all that isn't enough for you, another thing known on the Western Front was the European brown rat. Now this tells you how much my wife loves me. This is an actual European brown rat that she imported from England. So she got the right one. And she's not a freak like me. She's a normal person. She's a normal person, so she had to work at this. But I used to, I've got a stuffed pigeon with the with a message carrier on the leg. And the kids would always say, after they saw that, when I got to the court about the right or the rats, they'd say, Do you have a stuffed rat? So for Christmas, my little buddy here, nicknamed Mistletoe by my children. And in fact, they were hanging over our head one year. <laughs> 
The European brown rat ran rampant, carrying disease, stealing food, biting the soldiers, and this is a tiny one. They were, they, they were known to get as big as kittens. The soldiers would turn small dogs loose in the trenches. And if you've ever seen somebody come back from a pheasant hunt or a fishing trip, and here's their catch laid out, I've seen pictures of these little dogs with their kills for the day. And all these rats, or maybe they're hanging by their tails off of, off of uh, wooden, wooden sticks. The South Africans were known to do something interesting with the rats. This is a bayonet from the period. If you know about bayonets, it sits on the end of the rifle with the muzzle right here. They would stick pieces of bread on the end of the bayonet, laying it out across. The rats were grazing. They would climb up the rifle out to the tip of it, and guess what is right behind them? Let your imagination run from there. This was the South African. So, rats, mud, lice, boredom. It wasn't a very pleasant place to be. Now some of the soldiers might be lucky enough to be near an officer's quarters. They had dugouts. And they were somewhat inhabitable compared. And if you were, you might get the joy of listening to a little bit of music. This is a 1911 Victor Victrola. It is, as I tell the high school kids, this is the iPod of 1918. <laughs> because it is, it's, it's uh, obviously uh, portable. And m some of the officers would get their hands on it. Tigers fans. If you've ever listened to the ball games, that is the fight song of the, of the University of Missouri. Very few people realize that, but it was a it was a British marching song that when they brought when they came home from the war, the university wanted up adopting the song. Any Nebraska fans? Yeah. I'm sure you enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a wonderful song. You know, I, I've got to tell you, my, my, my oldest daughter, she's 12 now. You know, they talk about, you should speak to the baby when it's in the womb. My wife said, well, why don't you sing to it? I didn't know any other songs than World War I marches. <laughs> I can tell you this. I didn't think about it until after she was born, because about every night I would sing Tipperary to my wife's stomach. <laughs> 
a lot. Right. I kind of get used to it after a while. But <laughs> McKenna is her name. McKenna was crying, and I didn't know what else to do. But I started singing Temporary, and immediately she stopped crying and looked. And for years, I could sing Temporary, and it could only be me, and it could only be that song, and she would stop crying in any circumstances, and she would immediately look. She knew that song. So it's a very special song in our household. <laughs> this one is Stanley Kirkby. Stanley Kirkby. Yes. Yeah, this is a this is an original record. I looked at the serial number to make sure I had the right the right vintage. Gotta be accurate, see. Because the kids will pick you apart if not. I never show up with a big with the kids. Never. Beat rocks together. Make sure, make sure that they're but I'll tell you what, even the most hardened high school boy who's sitting in the back above all of this will lean forward and smile when they hear the Victrola. There's something magical about it. So, so life in the trenches was horrible. But leaving the trenches was even worse. Because remember what I told you, you never stuck your head up. And then you heard the bombardment. And you knew either you were going over or somebody was coming at you. And you listened to hear where are the shells coming from. You really prayed that it was coming from their side even though they were firing at you because nobody wanted to, to leave the trench. Now, between you and your enemy was about 250 yards. Can anybody tell me what that 250 yards was called? No man's land. No man's land. Nobody owned it. Nobody went in it. it was, nobody ever touched it unless they had to. So maybe days, maybe hours, but a lot of time, days before an attack, the artillery would start firing. 77, 75s, good-sized artillery. I can tell you that in 1916 at the Somme, the British had one of the largest bombardments in history, over about a 20 miles spread. And they did this for days. And on July 1st of 1916, the British did what was called going over the top. They, they got out of their trenches and went across. Within a few hours that morning, the British suffered 60,000 casualties. It's the bloodiest day in British history. And our grandfather had a cousin, Gilbert Gregg, who was in the 17th service battalion of the Highland Light Infantry. And at the near the village of Thibbal, Gilbert went over the top. And he was never seen again. Gilbert Gregg, July 1st, 1916. 60,000 casualties in three to four hours. It's unimaginable today. Unimaginable. So, here was the idea of the bombardment. The idea was to fire across, kill as many of your opponent as you could, but more, more importantly, to knock out this. This is original trench wire, German manufacturer, or it's early in the war because you can tell because of the spacing. As metal became more precious, the barbs got wider and wider. But this wasn't strong like a barbed wire fence in a cow pasture like we think of today. This was strewn in a morass. Thousands of strands, almost in a blanket. And so the idea was to blow paths through this. Where the British failed in 1916, there were a lot of things that went wrong in that, but one of the things that went wrong, they were firing shrapnel shells. And a lot of people think of shrapnel as the, the fragment, or the, the fragments of the shells. That's, that's actually just shell fragments. Shrapnel is actually the small balls that are inside the shell that when it explodes, it acts something like a shotgun that explodes above you. 
Well, think about that. Firing a shotgun at a woven wire fence it didn't do anything. The wire was intact. So as the war went along, they got better and better at their bombardments. They had all kinds of different creepy mirages where the soldiers would come right in underneath the shells and they would just crank the guns up a little bit more and a little bit more and the soldiers would just come in right underneath the protection of those shells until they were right up on top of the, of the trenches. Can everybody still hear me okay? This is a really big group. Usually I've got about 30 students right in front of me and I don't use a, a microphone. So if, if, if you can't hear me, let me know, okay? So another thing that you had to look for, caltrips. They would sink in the mud, but they began where they would attach them to pieces of wood. These were originally to stop horses and infantry running along. These date back to Roman times. But no matter how I toss it, the point always comes up. And it was to impale your boot. It hurt. So, I think I've seen that cow tropes. Yeah. So as the bombardment would go along, suddenly a junior officer or a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant, might approach and say, 30 minutes, we're going over, 30 minutes. Packs in battle order, 30 minutes. Men began writing letters, their perhaps their last letters. They would arrange them themselves, they would get rid of anything that was going to slow them down, making sure they had additional ammunition. 15 minutes! 15 minutes! I mean, this is when the nerves are really starting to tighten because the bombardment is getting more and more intense at this time. It's, it's reaching a crescendo. And as they're firing, as your artillery is firing, the Germans are firing back at you, realizing that they've got to kill as many of you as they can before you come out of those trenches. And so they're up against the walls. And, and the soil and the rocks are coming down. And they're, they're trying to get as close to that as the, the parapet as they possibly can. Five minutes. Now, boys, when you get to the other side, why don't you make sure you wipe your feet before you get in that trench? Because there's a war on, doesn't mean that you should forget the, the, uh, the man as your mama taught you. Two minutes. They began, they were checking one another to make sure had their packs right, had these where they needed to be. Fix bayonets. The bayonets came out, placed on the rifle. And then, probably the most mournful sound that I can ever think of hearing. The trench whistle. And over the top, the soldiers would go. Many of them hadn't ever been out into this. Who knew what awaited you? Did they knock down the barbed wire? Were the German machine guns cut down? What were you running into? And then suddenly somebody says, gas! And you've got this right here, your gas mask. This is the gas mask of the period for the American Army, the corrected English model. Some people call it, the British called it the uh, small box respirator. Goes up onto your face. I've actually got one of these that is still soft. I don't know how it was stored, but it's still soft. And you got a flutter valve down here for the exhale. When you breathe in, the valve closes. And there's a there's a mouthpiece. Fits in like a like a snorkel. So you put this on. Now you've got the rifle. You've got your gas mask swinging. You're, there's, there's little pockets here where you can reach up and wipe the condensation off of your, off of your glasses, off the, the, the gas mask goggles. And then you hear it. 
Right, 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 right. Is it in your sector? Stay in your lines, stay in your lines. Because they're trying to get you across as fast as you can and they don't want them spreading all out. So you're in some ways you're sitting up because you're going through the pathways that have hopefully been cut. Right, 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 right. Right, 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 right. Men are dropping to the left and right of you. And eventually you see it. You see the sandbags of the parapet of the other trench. What awaits you? Are there, are there Germans there? Yeah. Pop! And you hear it. There's one. You go over, you go over into their trench. Hand to hand fighting, knuckle knives. Soldiers would take their spades and sharpen the edges. Use them like like hatchets coming down at the neck and the shoulder. The Americans carried shotguns with bayonets on the end of them. The Germans protested, saying it was cruel. The Americans <laughs> said, get rid of the gas, we'll get rid of the shotguns. <laughs> Needless to say, the shotguns lasted to the end of the war. They called them trench guns. And they were great for walking down the trenches and just clearing out. This was the life of the American soldier in the First World War. It's unimaginable to me. I talked to World War I veterans when I was a kid and there was no way I could understand what they had went through. I thought I did and to this day I understand I do not understand. They fought at places, you heard it in the Blackjack video, Katini, Bella Wood, San Miel, our grandfather was a Somnio. The Mews are gone. When the guns finally fell silent, in the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, there were 116,000 American dead. That was only a small percentage of the 10 million that had been killed during the war. And that's not even taking into account the influenza and civilian deaths. 10 million dead, 116,000 Americans. And see, this is where I tell the students, Memorial Hall isn't just about remembering the war. It's specifically remembering those 116,000. And in Joplin, there are the names of those from Jasper County that didn't come home. And I tell the students, they weren't much older than you, some of them your same age, if I'm speaking to a senior class. They were young people with dreams and hopes and aspirations. And they gave it all up. And the reason they gave it up is you. For your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations. I plead with them, please, the next time you're at Memorial Hall, read the names. Realize they were real people, real young people, at the very beginning of their lives. You have to, I plead with them, you have to appreciate their sacrifice. Because if you don't, you will not value the gift they gave us. And that's our freedom. Anything you do not value, you will discard. You will forfeit. You will give it away. So I beg them to stop and read the names. And I always think, if one kid reads the names and appreciates what he's got, then all the scratchy wool in the world is worth it. And I will share with you this. I've had kids come up to me years later when they recognize me, say, you're the World War I guy. <laughs> I read the names. That's why I do what I do. I thank you very, very much for listening to me today. And I hope this has been informative.
we've got to take a break now, aren't we? <laughs> you you just had, uh, and you know it, uh, probably the best week, best best hour yeah. of this week.